Kiddos, today we're going to talk about metathesis reactions. Now, when you see metathesis reactions, you can also think of them as double replacement, double displacement reactions, um, precipitation reactions um, is a part of metathesis reactions. They all sort of fall under that umbrella. Um, this is, might be new terminology to you. Um, if you were one of my students, we called them double replacement reactions in Chem 1. Uh, but they're metathesis reactions. Here's what metathesis reactions means. So I've got two compounds. Now typically what is necessary for these compounds is that these are ionic compounds and particularly the way that this is going to work better is if the, your reactants, the things on the left of the arrow here, if they are strong electrolytes. Okay, if you remember, strong electrolytes are things that completely disassociate. What that will do for us is that with, if these things completely dissociate, then when we combine them, or even really before we combine them, but when we combine them, what we actually have are not two compounds, but rather four ions, okay? And two positive ions, cations, and two negative ions, anions. And so what's gonna occur then in the metathesis reaction is that we're gonna swap the places of the cations. Now, some professors might tell you they're swapping the places of the anions. It really doesn't matter that much. Um, I've always done it as swapping the cations, so that's, I'm just going to continue in that vein. The cations are going to swap places, and then what that means is that we're going to end up with B is going to be with X, so cation B with anion X, okay? And then that's going to leave us with cation A with anion Y. So what does that actually look like if we were seeing a real reaction? Well, let's look at that then. Okay, so given a real reaction, one in fact that you very likely have probably already done in class, silver nitrate, sodium chloride. These are both strong electrolytes. They're very soluble in water, okay? So aqueous solutions of them. They're gonna completely dissociate. Now what that means as far as completely dissociate, what that would really mean is that I would end up with silver ions okay, in the aqueous state, sodium, or I'm sorry, nitrate, and chloride ions. So really what's going to happen is that if we break everything up into the ions, and we're going to need to do this in a second, we're going to do net ionic equations momentarily, but to tell us what the products are going to be, we split everything up into the ions, and then I sort of do, what, because I think students are semi-familiar with this at least, um, you sort of did a FOIL method in math class, and so what I do is I tell students to take the outside and then the inside, because the outside would give me silver with the chloride, and then the inside would give me sodium with the nitrate, which would mean that each of those things was swapping its partner in the dance as it were. Okay, so what does that then do for us? Well. Anytime we're, we're trying to figure out what an ionic formula is, remember we need to crisscross things. I'm going to do that really briefly. It's not quite as necessary in this case because in reality, since everything has a plus one charge, the charges are going to balance out anyway. But I'm going to do that real quick just so you can see what's going on. So we've got silver is going to go with chloride. We're going to swap those out. Okay, we bring the ones down for each thing. That means I've got silver chloride. Then I'm going to crisscross sodium with my nitrate. So one, remember that if you're doing a polyatomic, the one goes outside of the polyatomic. You don't replace that subscript and a one, and that's going to give me sodium nitrate. Okay, so those would be our products. Okay, so we would write those over on this side of the equation. I'm going to have to sort of space them out because we're out of room here. Plus... Sodium nitrate. Now, actually we're not done because what is necessary in this case is that we not only find the products, okay, which I did, we crisscrossed things, got, got our products, everything looks great, but you would then have to consult a chart of solubility rules or better yet, know your solubility rules to figure out are these two products, are they then aqueous or are they solid, okay? In other words, do we get a precipitate out of this? Is this a precipitation reaction? Or do we get nothing? Here's the thing. If you did the crisscross and you get that they're both aqueous, what that really means 
is that there was no reaction because it means that you started with four aqueous ions and then at the end, if they're all still aqueous, then you still have four aqueous ions. And so nothing really happened, okay? So if we look at a solubility chart, we would immediately see that sodium and nitrates are always aqueous, okay? So sodium compounds, pretty much always aqueous. Nitrate compounds, always soluble, dissolves in water, boom, got that. Chloride salts are almost always aqueous, except silver. And so if you look under your solubility rules and you saw salts of chloride ions, you would say, oh, it's aqueous. But then you look and there were a couple of exceptions there. And silver is one of them. That's going to give us a nice white precipitate. We get a precipitation reaction out of that. Okay. So we're going to work one more of these real quick, and then we're going to break it apart and actually show the whole net ionic equation on that one as well. So lead nitrate, potassium iodide, both aqueous. Both of these are strong electrolytes. You might be saying, how do I know that they're strong electrolytes? Well, the fact that we've got these in aqueous solution, that's enough for us now. In reality, later on in your chemistry career, particularly in AP Chem, um, you would have KSP values and all of that that you could know. But these are strong electrolytes. We know that that's almost always going to be soluble. That's a halide. That's a group one metal. Those are pretty much always going to be soluble as well. Again, solubility rules are really going to serve you well here. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to break this apart into the constituent ions. Okay, and then we're going to find the products like we did in the last one. And then we're going to get rid of stuff to get a net ionic equation. So let's break it apart. So my first ion is a lead two. Now, how do I know that it's a lead two? I don't, I mean, lead is one of those things that could have multiple charges, right? How do I know specifically that it's lead two? Well, remember, I know what nitrate is because nitrate's a polyatomic. It has a negative one charge. And since I have two of them, two times that negative one means for this to be balanced, that has to be a plus two. You probably remember that from chem one, but just to be sure, okay? And then we're going to say, that we've got nitrate. So remember, we want to go outsides together. So I'm going to put lead with iodide. And then insides together, I'm going to put potassium with nitrate. And then we're going to do our quick crisscross. So lead 2 plus, iodide, that becomes a 2. Okay, so that's important. In our last one, everything was ones and it bounced out. I need to know that my first product is lead iodide and that there's a two there. If I looked at my solubility rules or if you knew your solubility rules pretty well, you would know that that lead iodide is going to be a solid. It is insoluble. Okay, second one, we're going to take potassium. I'm going to crisscross it with nitrate. You might be thinking, well, there are two nitrates. That does not matter. I'm not worried about my coefficients here. That doesn't matter when you crisscross. Again, that goes outside of the polyatomic. And so my second product then is potassium nitrate. Put a plus sign in there. That is aqueous. Okay, so that's great. Now, what that aqueous means, of course, is that in reality, there is no real like potassium nitrate, that what there really is is potassium ions and nitrate ions hanging out in solution. So that's going to allow us to do a little bit extra step there. So I've got this part all broken out into its ions. I'm going to race our crisscross here, and I'm going to break this into its ions to do the next step. Okay, so here's all I've done here. This I left as it was. Those are the ions that those aqueous compounds broke up into. This does not break apart. It's a precipitate, right? It's a solid. That's the stuff down at the bottom of the solution. Or, I mean, that would be after you centrifuge it, or just sort of hanging out in the solution. These ions, though, this is aqueous, so those actually break apart, okay? Again, potassium and nitrate are very soluble in water, so they're not going to really form a compound. Those are two ions that are going to break apart and become aqueous ions. So what does that mean for us? Well, this right here is what we call a complete ionic equation. What that means is that I've broken everything that I could into its constituent ions in solution. Okay, these are the ions that are in solution. What about that? That's an ionic compound, but it's not in solution, right? It's a precipitate. It's solid. 
The way that you get a net ionic equation is that you cross out all of the spectator ions. So what are the spectator ions? Here's, the, here's how this works. Spectators are everything that's aqueous on both sides of the equation. Okay? We're not going to worry so much about coefficients. We're going to worry about what's aqueous on both sides of the equation. What can I get rid of? Okay? And then we're going to write down what's left. Well, potassium is aqueous on both sides of the equation. I'm going to cancel that out. Nitrate also aqueous on both sides of the equation. Again, I said we're going to ignore that coefficient because I didn't really even need to put it at all. Okay? So those are canceled. Those are the only things that are the same on both sides. That is solid. That's aqueous. That's part of the solid. That's aqueous. So they're not the same. So what that means is I've canceled out my spectators. The spectators are just what they sound like. They're on the Olympic standing around team. They're just sitting in the stands watching stuff happen. The things that are actually taking part in the reaction are the lead and the iodide, and they're going to form that precipitate. So what's left? Well, what's left is our net ionic equation. Our net ionic equation in this case is lead 2 plus iodide aqueous yields my solid lead 2 iodide. Okay, and I'm not done. Once you get to your net ionic equation, you then need to balance it. In this case, that's real simple. I've got two over here, so I'm going to put a two in front of that. That is now my balanced net ionic equation. Net ionic equation is actually really useful because what this essentially does for us is it distills down all of this to this really simple equation. And so if we had to then do some stoichiometric calculations to figure out how much of this are we going to get, um, if we were doing a titration or anything like that, we, the, the simplicity of this allows us to be able to do that a lot easier than having to know all of this. And in many cases, it helps your balancing out um, a lot more. So that's a metathesis reaction, and that is how we get to a net ionic equation. Thanks, kiddos.